So uh, let me begin by, you know, um, say to, um, to Ken, you know, your, your, your thoughts on the role of PSA doubling times uh, when deciding on, on when to start treatment. And maybe it's not just an NMCRPC, but just you know, biochemical relapse in general. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think PSA doubling time is really critical. I think we didn't think about it for a long time. I think we probably all thought about it maybe 20 years ago. It was important. Then it kind of just went away. Um, and now I think it's really critical. So in someone who's got a doubling time less than 10 months or around 10 months, we know that this is clinically relevant, a clinically relevant change. He's got clinically relevant disease. If his PSA doubling time had been a couple years or four years, maybe there was just a little bit of benign tissue left behind, you know, it's a different animal. But clearly with a doubling time under 10 months, uh, it's definitely something we want to treat and be more aggressive with because we know if we don't, that time to metastatic disease is much less. So let me ask you, uh, Jorge or Alicia, you want to chime in on this? So yeah, I mean, we really have some good uh, prior trials that showed that this PSA doubling time calculation of 10 months or less, which informed the three trials, maybe one of you would like to talk about what was some of the early work Matthew Smith had done. We'd done some work to, all of us were, I think, involved in this notion around the doubling time and how it affected the likelihood for developing metastases. Yeah, great. So um, I completely agree with you, and I think that um, we all are familiar with Matthew Smith's data, I think published in JCO a number of years ago. It was a phase three clinical trial of denosumab for the prevention of metastatic disease in men with non-metastatic CRPC. So really thinking about this particular population. And in that data, we could see a very clear association between a decreasing PSA doubling time and an increased risk of metastatic disease or death from prostate cancer. Um, and really, it was interesting that there was an inflection point somewhere between eight and 10 months where the curve just really took off in that particular data set. So I think that solidifies, particularly in the non-metastatic CRPC population, the importance of this doubling time, though of course it was defined in natural history cohorts too, uh, Jorge. I don't yeah. know if you want to share any yeah. of that data. So, so I think if I can go back a little bit in the history of this case, I think that we all agree that doubling time is a super, super important uh, surrogate marker for survival and for time to metastasis. But if you go back in the history of this case, you can probably select uh, pieces of the patient that are actually really also telling us as clinicians the importance of early, aggressive, if you want to call it that management. Uh, the fact that he has a strong family history of other cancers that would raise a flag right now for us for maybe he has a DNA repair deficiency that would increase his risk of having pretty aggressive disease. Secondly, the fact that he pretty ha had a pretty aggressive disease, right? Uh, he had positive margins, but his inability to achieve an undetectable PSA also is telling to me, right? Uh, whether or not you agree to early radiation or a little bit of deferred radiation therapy, I think we have compelling data demonstrated as imperfect as the messing data was back in the 90s, right? Then early ADT for this patient population may in fact impact outcome in a positive manner. I do agree that early treatment becomes challenging when you look at the side effect profile and the impact of quality of life on suppression of testosterone, but I think most of us, the bigger controversy for us in the field has been the timing of initiation of ADT. And it is uh, that controversy that actually is applicable to this patient because if this patient had been followed with serial PSAs and waited until they developed metastatic disease, we wouldn't have seen M0 CRPC. So by default, and you mentioned that, can we induce his state migration, right? We induce his CRPC by virtue of us initiating ADT early and therefore inducing CRPC. So I think doubling time is absolutely critical today, as you point out, Ken. But I think the history of, his, of this patient is also quite telling us that his time to progression, or time to biochemical progression, and time from biochemical progression to castration resistance this is pretty tight, it's pretty close, telling you that this patient does have, in fact, aggressive disease. Yeah, yeah spot on. So right, I mean, he had you know, you know, aggressive histopathology, he had positive margins, when he got started on his ADT, he had a very short time before he became castration resistant, and the doubling time's pretty rapid. The earlier work done, you know, by, by Matthew Smith and others, we did the Amgen trials, and we actually had an ODAC on it. It was interesting, the, 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 the bone metastasis free survival met its endpoint, yet the drug wasn't approved. Um, and interestingly, having been there, they went around, they polled everybody at the panel at the ODAC, and they said, well, what do you want to see? 
And interestingly, they said, we want to see about two years. We want to see two years. And that, that the BMFS for the, the, that particular trial, which met its end point and was statistically significant, was only about four months, six months when it was really enriched.